Good evening. evening. Welcome to worship for our midweek Advent series. We are going through this series called Proclamations of Peace. Now imagine a world without peace. You don't have to think too hard, do you? We live in a world that's riddled with sin, a world full of uh, anger, full of hate, full of the, the lack of peace. And that's what makes this series so wonderful for us, because we see where true peace comes from. Peace doesn't come from uh, turning over every rock in this world, and, and if you discover it, you're, you're lucky. No, it doesn't come from this world. It comes from our God, and he gives it to us freely of his own accord. So it's a, a wonderful thing that we talk about, these proclamations of peace uh, for us as sinners, for all people, and how this proclamation of peace is for all eternity. So we pray that God would be with us today as we come before him to praise him and worship him and thank him for this peace. We begin with our opening sentences. Please stand. Jesus Christ is the light of the world. The light no darkness can overcome. Stay with us, Lord, for it is evening, and the night is almost over. Be our light and scatter the darkness, and hear our evening prayer of rain. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who led your people Israel with a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Enlighten our darkness by the light of your Christ. May his word be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. For you are merciful and you love your whole creation. We, your creatures, glorify you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You may be seated. Let the incense of our prayers rise before you, O Lord, and let your mercy descend on us, that we may sing your praises with the church on earth and forever in heaven, through Jesus Christ our Lord. We sing Psalm 1. Thank you. 
Lord God, grant us your Holy Spirit that we may hear and believe your word. Cleanse our minds and renew our hearts that we may live for you here and hereafter. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Our first reading uh, for this series comes from Romans chapter 5. This lesson serves as a basis for our sermon. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we also have obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice confidently on the basis of our hope for the glory of God. For at the appointed time, while we were still helpless, Christ died for the ungodly. It is rare indeed that someone will die for a righteous person. Perhaps someone might actually go so far as to die for a person who has been good to him. But God shows his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Therefore, since we have now been justified by his blood, it is even more certain that we will be saved from God's wrath through him. For if, while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, it is even more certain that since we have been reconciled, we will be saved by his life. And not only is this so, but we also go on rejoicing confidently in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received this reconciliation. The Lord will come again in glory. The Spirit and the church cry out, Come, Lord Jesus, come. We sing our next hymn.
Your brothers and sisters in Christ, grace, mercy, and peace be yours in abundance from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus. Amen. Have you ever noticed how what you say or how you say it is very important? You can say the same thing, but if you say it different ways, it has a totally different meaning. You can say, if your wife asks you to take out the garbage, sure, I'll do that, and you actually mean it. Or you can say, sure, I'll do it, and it's got a totally different connotation to it when you say it like that. The words that we use and the way that we use them are very important. You've witnessed that in your everyday life. The words that we choose to use when we want to talk to a friend who's hurting, we might go down to their level, we might speak in a, a calmer voice, we might go a little bit slower and softer, if we're really excited that somebody just scored a touchdown, we might get all excited and talk a little bit faster. The way that we use our words, the words that we use, and how we portray those words with the inflection in our voice is important. I think that's why I love this book of Romans so much. Go ahead, go home, and, and start reading the book of Romans from chapter 1, and, and Anybody who reads it will just be nodding their head along and, and just become overwhelmed with how wonderful this Word of God is and just how straightforward it, it tells it. See, where we're going to jump into is in the middle of, of two sections. The first four chapters, Paul kind of sets the scene for the Romans where he talks about, uh, essentially in, in chapter 3, how all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God that all are sinners, the whole world. There's, there's no way around it, every single being besides Jesus, of course. And then he goes on a little bit in chapter 4 to talk about how through faith, Abraham, it was credited to him as righteousness, this wonderful salvation that God can give. And so when we jump into our lesson from chapter 5 here, it says, therefore, one of those important words that, that maybe you've heard me say before in sermons that you need to pay attention to. It happens when you jump right into the middle of something and, and you don't know what it is. This, this conjunction there, this therefore is like a conclusion word. A word that means that something else just happened before this. And, and that's why I wanted to explain a little bit of the context. Talking about sin, how we're all sinners. Talking about how Abraham received righteousness through his faith. And then he goes on and says that, therefore, since we have been justified by faith. He's talking to a group of believers. He includes himself with those believers. And what he goes on from here to say is all of these wonderful, doctrine-rich Lutheran words that we want to understand properly. Because if you read this and you don't know what these words mean, it doesn't make that much sense. And it doesn't have that impactful of a meaning. So what we're going to do is just walk through this lesson and look at these wonderful words that God has given us. We've already talked about therefore. We've already talked about we. And now we talk about this next phrase, that we have been justified by faith. 
This word justify has different uh, connotations around it, different ways we can, we can use it in our secular world. We can try to justify our actions when we've done something wrong. That's not the way that this word is being used in a biblical sense. When the Bible uses the word justify or justified or justification or any one of those nuances of the word, it always has this picture of a courtroom. You've seen courtrooms if you've watched Judge Judy or something like that. Picture a more frightening courtroom than that, even though she can be kind of scary sometimes. And picture you're the one that's on trial. There's the defendant, there's the prosecutor, and there's the judge. And that prosecutor is trying to say everything possible against you that you have done wrong. Imagine that prosecutor himself to be Satan, the one who's hurling all of these accusations at you, and that's really what he does. And the thing is, he knows what we've done. He's right when we've done those things. He, he throws these things back in our face, these sins that we've done, and he makes us feel guilty. Not only did he tempt us into sin, but then he pulls the second punch or throws the second punch where he makes us feel guilty for that sin. And all of those accusations he hurls at us are correct. And so we're sitting there on trial, completely guilty of everything that they're throwing at us. And that judge is about to hammer down his gavel and say guilty. But then our defendant steps in. And our defendant is Jesus. And Jesus says, I've paid the price for everything that they've done. Everything that you've done, all your guilt was laid on me, and I took it away. So instead of that verdict coming down guilty, what justification means is that it comes down not guilty, that you're innocent, that you're forgiven. So how can we be justified? It's by faith. Our justification comes by faith. Faith is essentially trust. And faith is only as good as the object in which you place that trust. I can trust the weatherman when he says there's going to be a 20-degree drop in like two hours when a cold front comes through, and maybe he's right, maybe he's wrong. I can trust my favorite sports team to win every time, but we all know that's not always going to happen. If the object of your faith is Jesus, well, you have something sure and certain to build upon. You have that chief cornerstone, as Scripture calls it, to trust in. And when you lay your trust on that with that firm foundation, you can be sure that everything that comes up after that through the faith, all those wonderful promises that come through God's Word, are yours. Because your faith is securely put in Jesus. So since we have been justified by faith, we now have peace. If I keep going like this, we're not going to be able to get out of here for a few hours. So I won't go through every single word. But these words are important. Peace, you could, you could write a, a whole eulogy or a whole sermon on just the word peace that we have with God. Peace is something that you see um, that the, the world says that they want, yet they're not always willing to go out and, and make happen. It's also something that they can't go out and, and actually make happen if they tried. Because the world searches for peace in all sorts of different ways. It wants to go to the ends of the earth, flipping over every stone, trying to find where they can be satisfied, where they can find peace. And maybe the closest you get is on some distant island where you're drinking a, a margarita and your toes are in the sand. And even that is fleeting. The peace that God talks about here in his word and, and wherever you hear it in his word is a true peace, a lasting peace, a peace that can only come through our Savior Jesus because that is the peace of knowing that your sins are truly forgiven. You can talk to a psychologist or a therapist and they can take away those feelings of guilt perhaps and those feelings, you don't feel so bad anymore, but that guilt is always going to be there. Jesus can actually take away 
the stem of what gives us a lack of peace, that, that guilt, that sin. And so peace with God is true peace, an everlasting peace, a peace that only God can give and one that he gives freely and fully through our Lord Jesus Christ. So you see how these words are important? You see these different pictures that come up when we read through the, this chapter of Romans, and, and that's just the first verse. Therefore, thinking of all the stuff he'd already talked about, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We go on. Through him we also have obtained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, and we rejoice confidently on the basis of our hope for the glory of God. I could talk about all these different words, but I'll only take a few. We rejoice confidently. When we rejoice, do you ever do so not confidently? It's kind of an interesting phrase there that we talk about, that we rejoice confidently. But the, the picture that we have described here is one that's talked about in the Old Testament, like, like when a, a calf is released um, out into the, the field after being cooped up all night, and it goes leaping, and it, and it, and it jumps, and it's, it's full of jubilee. We are filled with that same kind of joy, a joy that is confident, a, a joy that we know has no end, a joy that keeps, keeps going and going, one that is like God's outpouring of love for us. Like we, we hold out our cup and, and ask for a, a little bit of joy in our lives, and he, and he pours it so much that it overflows. As David says in the psalm, my cup is overflowing. We are filled with joy, and we're confident because of it. We can walk tall. We can, we, not in, a, in an arrogant way, not in a, in a puffing up our chest way, look at me, but confident in our God. We rejoice confidently on the basis of the hope for the glory of God. That, that hope, again, a wonderful word, a word that teaches us that it's not like the hope of this world that's wishy-washy. Like, I, I hope it's warmer out tomorrow. I hope it doesn't snow the next couple of days. I, I hope my car starts, even though the battery's been dying. That's a wishy-washy kind of wishful thinking. But when God uses the word hope, it's not like an uncertainty, but it's the exact opposite of that. It's a sure and certain thing that God is saying for us. When we talk about the hope of God, we have something rock solid to stand on. So what is Paul trying to tell us with all these beautiful words? He's trying to make this conclusion for us that we have this wonderful access to God by faith which gives us this wonderful reason to rejoice because he's given us salvation. So that's why this lesson is the first of our little midweek Lenten series about proclamations of peace. It sets the tone for what God wants to tell us. In these different lessons, we get a look at these different proclamations, these different words about what God has done for us. And that's very meaningful to us because we know that we don't deserve any of it. It says, For at the appointed time, while we were still helpless, Christ died for the ungodly. He goes on a little bit later, and he points it out more clearly. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We were the ungodly. We were the unrighteous. We were sinners. But God wanted to change all that. So he didn't just make a proclamation of peace for you and for me that said, um, that, that was empty words. No, words are important. And his words have deep meaning to them. And not only do they mean so much, but he fulfills what he says. And he carries out the promises that he makes. 
That very first promise that he made was one of a savior. One that he made right after the very first sin, quickly after that came the very first promise of the savior. And he reminded his people through that, throughout time again and again of this promise. And even though they'd fall away, even though they turn to idols, even though they'd reject God and really cheat on him with other gods, he would forgive and he would let there be a, a remnant left of believers and carry on this wonderful line of his promises all the way to Jesus. So that when Jesus came, he was our savior. So that when he who is the Christ died for us while well, we were saved. That's the wonderful news that God has given us through these proclamations of peace. It's all wrapped up in Christ. That's easy to say because all of the Bible is wrapped up in Christ. It's Christocentric. Whether it's the Old Testament or the New Testament, it's all wrapped up in him. And here, Paul lays it out so clearly for us that we can't help but marvel at how wonderful it is that God has given us full and free salvation, that we're declared not guilty, justified, that we, we have this faith in God, a faith which he works in us. It's not our own work, it's his work, so that there's peace, so that there's hope, all for us sinners. But there's still more to what he has to say. Therefore, since we have now been justified by his blood, it is even more certain that we will be saved from God's wrath through him. For if, while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by death of his son, it is even more certain that since we have been reconciled, we will be saved by his life. That reconcile word is a very important word. It comes up again even later in a different form, reconciliation. In just these few verses, he uses it several times. What's really interesting about this word reconcile is that it always is passive on our end. We don't do the reconciling. We are reconciled. You know how passive and active verbs work, right? Like if I throw a ball at you, I, I threw the ball, you were hit by the ball. It's, it's different. You didn't do anything. You just got hit by it. That's kind of how reconciliation works. God does the reconciling. We just receive the reconciliation. And what that word means is to repair a broken relationship. Picture that we were, picture what it must have been like in the Garden of Eden when there was no sin, just perfection, everything right, everything harmonious, a perfect relationship between humans, man and woman, and between their God. Nothing was wrong. But then when sin entered the world, it was like this stark schism between them. It separated them from God. It cut them off from him. That relationship was no longer right and harmonious, but broken and destroyed so that we're rightfully called enemies. One of the words I skipped over, so this wouldn't go so long for you. That we were rightfully called enemies of our God. But God repaired that broken relationship for us. He repaired it through his son, Jesus. Even though we were enemies, even though we were sinners, he did that. Now, I keep saying that, that we were these things. And maybe you're scratching your head and thinking, well, well, gee, I, I still sin sometimes. Doesn't that make me that I still am a sinner? Well, yes, that's true. We are still sinners while we are also saints. We're sinner and saint at the same time. This side of heaven, we can't get rid of that sinful nature. But one day, we will be with him in heaven. And that's what he gets at before or what he finally gets at um, with this last little, pit, last little bit. And not only is this so, but we also go on rejoicing confidently in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have re now received this reconciliation. The final part of understanding that reconciliation is that it's perfectly repaired, that broken relationship. It, it's not like when you... You scuff your car and you try to buff it out yourself, but you can kind of see that paint mark that's still there. It's repaired, but it's not back to normal. No, it's completely brand new, completely the way that it was supposed to be, back to what it was before. 
a right, harmonious relationship. And something that God takes the time to make perfect, he doesn't go back on his word. He keeps his word. He keeps his promise. And so when he tells you that your relationship with him has been repaired, that you have access to him by faith, that you've been justified, that you can go to this glorious God freely and fully, and that you are forgiven, you can be certain that it's all true. God uses many words in the Bible. Many of these words we can use in our regular language, and they don't quite mean the same exact thing that they're supposed to mean when they come from God's word. But when we, we read God's word and we understand what these words mean, what he's trying to communicate to us, well, then we understand just how beautiful his plan of, salva of salvation is and just how important these words really are. If you like to go on and, and keep reading Romans, I, I'd encourage that. It's a, it's a wonderful book to read. Uh, it's, it's like everything you read, it just jumps out at you and makes you want to scream, yes, absolutely, and you find yourself nodding along and, and reading all the chapters in, in about 30, 40 minutes because it, it's just a book you can't put down. That's by intention of our God, to make it so that his word is, is living and active, so that we want to be in his word when we understand what his words have to mean. God's words are important. So cherish them. Take them to heart. Don't let them be tossed aside. Don't gloss over them. Don't say, I've, I've heard the word justified. I've heard about faith and peace and hope and love and grace and all of these words before. Really dig into them to know what they mean. Because God's word, every one of his words, are important. Amen. Please stand. Now may the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, may it guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. may be seated at this time we will collect the offering along with the connection cards
In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. For the leaders of our synod and district, for all pastors in Christ, for all who are servants of the church, and for all the people of God, let us pray to the Lord. For all who govern our nation, and for all public servants, that they may be upheld and strengthened for every good deed, let us pray to the Lord. For those who work to bring peace, justice, health, and protection in this and every place, let us pray to the Lord. For those who bring offerings, those who do good works in this congregation, those who toil, those who sing, and all who await from the Lord great and abundant mercy, let us pray to the Lord. For favorable weather, for an abundance of the fruits of the earth, and for peaceful times, let us pray to the Lord. For our deliverance from all affliction, wrath, danger, and need, let us pray to the Lord. For the faithful who have gone before us and are with Christ, let us give thanks to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Rejoicing in the fellowship of all the saints, let us commend ourselves, one another, and our whole life to Christ our Lord. Amen. Stir up your power, O Lord, and come. Protect us by your strength and save us from the threatening dangers of our sins. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Lord God, all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works come from you. Give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments. Defend us also from the fear of our enemies, that we may live in peace and quietness through the merits of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Let us praise the Lord. Praise be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. We sing our closing hymn. Jesus. 
Good evening again. Glad to have you with us in worship. A special welcome to those who joined us online. We have two more midweek Advent worship services. That'll be on Wednesday, December 7th and the 14th. Before then, there's an opportunity to worship on uh, for the ladies for Advent by candlelight. That'll be on Saturday, the 3rd at 630. And the men's have their Advent by firelight uh, at the same time. Um, over at the Parsonage. Uh, if it's cold, we'll just go inside. There is a children's Christmas service coming up then later in December, a week before Christmas. It's called Illustrations of Emmanuel. Look forward to having all the kids help us in worship. Our North Liberty Christmas worship will be Thursday, December 22nd at 6 p.m. in the North Liberty Community Center. Here we'll have Christmas Eve worship on Christmas Eve at 7 and then Christmas Day worship is a Sunday, so the Christmas Day worship will be our regular Sunday worship, uh, but with a Christmas emphasis, of course. That'll be at 9 a.m. Uh, also, for those of you who uh, are going to be able to make it to Caroline, that'll be tomorrow and in North Liberty. We're going to meet at the North Liberty Community Center whenever you can between like 3 and 6-ish and um, to kind of have a Friendsgiving Come when you can, and then after that, uh, we'll go uh, caroling at 6.30 uh, so we can work out uh, driving and stuff then, too. If you can make it, that's great. If you can't, we understand. Anything else I should announce? All right. Glad you could make it today, and you have a wonderful rest of your week. Look forward to seeing you on one of these many occasions that I read before. God bless. Thank you. 